perhaps Gerald Burrell's greatest contribution to conservation was his ability to get people who'd never thought about conservation interested in wildlife. And I think that was the talent that came through his ability to write, to transfer his enthusiasm for wildlife onto the printed page for people who probably never stopped to think about it before. Quite an astonishing talent to awaken people's interests in a way that they'd never had done before. And with the humour that I fear was probably missing with some of the more serious intents of conservation. In 1976, we opened our brand new and very beautiful reptile house. And Princess Anne, who was our patron, came over to open it for us. I said to her that, you know, reptiles generally get a very bad press. Uh, I mean, ever since the Garden of Eden, they've got a bad press. And so let's try and say something nice about them, which she did indeed. We try and keep her visits as informal as possible. And I remember um, sitting with her talking about reptiles while we had all our baby gorillas gambling about at her feet. Our reptile breeding program is going to be one of the most important because um, in the majority of zoos, nobody else does it, yes. Well, they just stick them into little cages, you know, and, and uh, they just lie there. Is, is there any particular reason why they don't do it? I think it's because um, most reptile houses in the past were designed purely as uh, show boxes, you know, and not as breeding areas. And never really dawned on them that might be a necessity yes. to breed yes. them at all, anyway. Yes. There's nothing quite like the scale and the appearance and the thing that never comes out on television, which is the smell <laughs> um, of, of wild animals or birds or anything else. The reintroduction of the golden eyed tamarinds in Brazil into full sized trees with branches that droop at the edges. For many of the youngsters who were not properly educated, i.e., the, the contents of their cages did not have droopy ends to their <laughs> branches, had several um, potentially rather nasty accidents <laughs> when they literally ran out of space and fell off the end because they hadn't learnt to cope with bendy branches. This didn't happen to the Jersey uh, Golden Eye Tamarins because they had been properly educated in branches <laughs> which did the natural thing and got thinner and thinner at the ends. You're beginning to see a growth and a spread of the influence of, of what is available, the experience, the pool of knowledge that's available in Jersey being spread through its training center around the world. And hopefully you just draw attention to what can be achieved and the, the, the amount that people are actually doing in order to bring those changes about. One of the important aspects of the Save the Children Fund's work is the environment in which young people are going to grow up in and that it should be able to sustain them in the long term. And if it's going to sustain man, it's actually going to have to sustain wildlife as well. Uh, the two go together. They can't be mutually exclusive because it doesn't work for either of them. If you only look at improving man's conditions in the short term, the chances are that in the long term it will deteriorate for everybody. And the fund is one of its keys is long-term sustainability. I'm not an optimist by nature, I don't think, but I can't not believe that if you provide the right sort of information for people, that they will in fact learn what is practical. And they, they will also learn what is necessary. And what is necessary is that we have to share what we have and keep that balance. And that will require an effort from us as well.